On the 28th of June, 1381, during the fourth year of the reign of King Richard II, the last courageous remnants of an army of simple peasants met its sad end. They had been forced into open rebellion against the king by the imposition of the pernicious poll tax. Now, only three weeks later, they had been slaughtered by the king's army and their dreams of justice lay shattered with the broken bodies in the fields of Billericay. The peasants' revolt was over. The great popular rising of the people during the Middle Ages is known to history as the Peasants' Revolt. This name, though not strictly accurate, captures perfectly the spirit of the rebellion, for it was an explosion of public rage against unfair, overbearing authority and unjust suppressive laws. Moreover, it was not merely simple peasants who took up arms in a dramatic attempt to overthrow the cruel, back-breaking feudal system and the despised poll tax. Many parish priests, laborers, artisans and small traders risked everything to give the great rebellion their full support. So what were the extraordinary circumstances which led the ordinary citizens of England to open revolt? Why were these simple folk prepared to spill their blood and risk their necks in a do-or-die attempt to improve their wretched lives. Trouble had undoubtedly been brewing in England for several years prior to the spectacular events of 1381. England's great monarch, Edward III, had finally died aged 64 on the 21st of June, 1377, after a reign of over 50 years. Although his death presented the opportunity for a new start, there was also a general sense of unease, for Edward's reign had provided a continuity which had now gone, and the future was unsure. Edward's eldest son, Edward, known as the Black Prince, had died in 1376, and the king had been succeeded by his grandson, the 10-year-old Richard II. Richard had been born in Gascony in France, and had been brought to England in 1371, where he was groomed for eventual kingship but the death of his father and grandfather brought him the crown unexpectedly early. A minority kingship presented a serious problem for the English throne in 1377, for there were great rifts within the royal family and a badly divided nobility. The natural candidate for the regency was John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. However, he was an ambitious fellow and his past misdeeds meant he was clouded in suspicion. Therefore, no regent was appointed, but a continual council was set in place to advise the king's ministers and decide on policy. In 1379, the council had to resolve the problems of a battered economy, and most important, how to finance the continuing war with France, which was crippling the country. The war with France continued on and off for decades, and its spiraling cost was imposing a greater and greater strain on the nation's purse. The King's Council had an answer to the problem. It was simply to impose a new tax upon the already hard-pressed people of England. The poll, or head tax, required each citizen over the age of 15 years to pay one shilling to the Treasury. To these people, some of them the poorest of the poor, it was a heartbreaking, cruel tax. For they laboured daily under the effects of the feudal system, which drained their every resource and this latest imposition was the last straw. In 1348 to 9, the Black Death hit England and wiped out between a third and a half of the entire population. And for the peasants that were left, this meant an enormous degree of pressure.
first of all, from the lords of their manors who wanted to maintain the standards of living they had had before the plague and who insisted that the peasants should work that much harder on the fields in order to compensate for those who had died. And at the same time, the king was putting additional pressure on all his subjects to pay for a series of disastrous wars in France, which culminated in the demand for the poll tax of 1380. 12 pence per head uh, on every adult in the population, uh, equivalent to three days' wages for a skilled person. And when commissioners were sent out into the uh, shires in the summer of 1381 to investigate the way in which the poll tax had been administered, the people simply revolted. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we have a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. The feudal system had been introduced into England by the Normans after their conquest of the country in 1066. The system was one of devolved power, from God and the king, through lords and vassals, right down to the lowest and the last recipient of feudal rights, the peasant, called a serf or villain. The villain was tied to the soil owned by his lord. He was the head of his family and was linked with other peasants in the community or village with a group share in the grazing rights and access to communal woodland. He worked as many hours as were necessary to produce a good healthy crop or produce good dairy stock. However, Neither he or his family ever saw the full fruits of their labours, for the Lord charged a rent for the land the villain worked and lived on. This rent took the form of money or surplus produce, or perhaps even forced labour on other estates. During the later part of the 14th century, the finances of the landowners were becoming more and more strained as demands on the land were increased. As a consequence, the local bailiffs were ordered to obtain more produce from the peasants and to clear larger areas of land to grow crops. They were also ordered to raise rents and apply fines for slow payment. Under this pitiless regime, much of the peasant class were close to starving as they were forced to forgo food so that rents could be met. More and more serfs were ordered to carry out forced labour by increasingly violent methods. Nonetheless, the picture was not all unremitting gloom. There were exceptions to the general trend towards poverty. By 1381, the peasant class themselves were divided. There was a new class of peasant who had managed to sell their produce at local markets at a profit. These families had been able to meet their rent demands and build up their own small businesses and even buy their own land. Despite this, however, they were still serfs and liable to taxes levied at their lord's discretion. They had to pay to bake their bread in the Lord's oven. They had to pay for the grinding of their corn. If the son of a serf sought a job away from the manor, he had to pay for the right. And even death came at a price, as a corpse could be fined by both the Lord and the priest. Added to these existing privations, the poll tax naturally came as a crippling blow to the villain and his family. Many were fined for non-payment, and many tried to run away, but they were caught and forced to toil on the land without hope of breaking free. In this time of unhappiness and discontent, there were those who, despite the threat of severe punishments, spoke out extolling the virtues of a new society. The church was charged with keeping the minds and spirits of the peasants under control, but there were some among them who saw the injustices upon the common people and worked hard for change. One such man was John Ball, who was originally from St. Mary's in York, but settled in Colchester. Ball had been the chaplain of St. James, but when he was denounced by the archbishop, thereby losing his position, he continued to work from Colchester, preaching against the rich men and the lords. He attacked tithes and serfdom, assuring the peasantry that it was possible to bring about a different and better world. 
by the time the Peasants' Revolt broke out, John Ball already had had a long career as a radical preacher uh, um, in the home counties area. And his popularity with his audiences had already got him into a lot of trouble with church authorities during the 1360s and the 70s. And he had been in and out of prison several times as a result of the radical nature of his teachings. At the time that the rebels rose in Kent, he was actually imprisoned by the Archbishop of Canterbury in Maidstone, and they released him from there. He then marched to Blackheath with the, the rebels of Kent and preached there a, a very remarkable and radical sermon, which undoubtedly fired the people present um, and encouraged them on uh, to take the city of London itself. In 1366, Archbishop Langham excommunicated Ball, and in April 1381, he was imprisoned upon the orders of Archbishop Sudbury. But the words and letters of John Ball were instrumental in fueling the defiance of the people. One contemporary chronicle tells of a sermon Ball gave in the marketplace in Kent. My good friends, matters cannot go well in England until all be held in common when there shall be neither vassals nor lords, when the lords shall be no more masters than ourselves. How ill they behave to us! For what reason do they hold us in bondage? Are we not all descended from the same parents, Adam and Eve? And what can they show, or what reason can they give, why they should be more masters than ourselves? They are clothed in velvet and rich stuffs, ornamented with ermine and other furs, while we are forced to wear poor clothing. They have wine, spices and fine bread, while we have only rye. And when we drink, it must be water. They have handsome seats and manners, while we must brave the wind and the rain in our labours in the fields. And it is by our labours that they have the wherewithal to support their pomp. We are called slaves. And if we do not perform our service, we are beaten, and we have no sovereign to whom we can complain. Let us go to the king and remonstrate with him. He is young, and from him we may obtain a favourable answer. And if not, we must ourselves seek to amend the conditions. Despite the tangible unrest which gripped the country, the government seemed completely unaware of the implications of imposing the poll tax and concerned themselves only with raising the required revenue. It was upon receipt of the first poll tax returns that they received their first inkling that all was not well, for the document made interesting reading. Apparently, the population of England had fallen by over half a million people in only five years. The tax was levied on single people over the age of 15 and married couples paid only one tax. By all accounts, the country now seemed to consist entirely of married men and women with children under the age of 15. Obviously, falsified returns had been received in their thousands. The treasurer, Robert Hales, was, however, singularly unamused. Recognising an attempt to defraud the government on a mass scale, he took the figures to the council. They lost no time in obtaining the king's permission to set about revising the returns. Another small step on the road to open revolt had been taken. It was in the spring of 1381 that a commissioner of the poll tax, Thomas Bampton, left London and made his way to Brentwood in Essex. His task was simply to revise the taxation returns that were suspected of being falsified. To help him in his work, Bampton had with him a clerk and a sergeant-at-arms, and he certainly had no inkling of the danger that lay ahead. Throughout England, other commissioners were hard at work, revising poll tax returns on the orders of the King's Council. Bampton began his inquiry on the 30th of May by ordering the folk of the marshland villages of Fobbing, Corringham and Stanford La Hope to appear before him at Brentwood. The peasants and the fishermen of Fobbing certainly turned up in great numbers, but not with their caps in hand. Unfortunately for Bampton, 
They came bearing weapons, flatly refusing to pay a penny more in taxation. In fact, their spokesman, Thomas Baker, was so defiant that Bampton commanded his sergeants to arrest him. Almost at once, the furious villagers turned on the official party, beating them with sticks and throwing mud and stones at them to drive them out of Brentwood. Bampton, the steward of a powerful lord, was utterly astounded at such savage treatment. He returned without delay to London to report to the King's Council. But even then, the councillors were unable to grasp the strength of the general anger against the poll tax. Arrogantly, they decided that the riot was merely an isolated incident, which would be dealt with ruthlessly as an example to other malcontents. And so Sir Robert Belknap, the Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, was sent to root out and punish the rioters of Brentwood. However, the men of Fobbing and Corringham had not been idle. For them, there was no turning back. The call to arms was sounded, and men from all around began to sharpen their axes and knives, their scythes and their spears in preparation for the fight. Large groups of men collected at Brentwood, Baddo and Colchester. These determined bands quickly organised themselves, taking experienced soldiers or local officials as their leaders. As the men mustered, messengers were sent into the countryside of southern Essex with a rallying cry. The time for action had come. The peasants' revolt had truly begun. Messages were received from London and Kent, offering their support in the fight against the King's Council and the officials trying to collect the hated poll tax. Indeed, the news of the rising in Essex was so well received that the men of Kent were already beginning to arm themselves. Of course, the unfortunate Belknap arrived in Brentwood with his retainers and his clerks, blissfully unaware of the angry reception that awaited him. He was instantly seized by the incensed mob, and his soldiers were disarmed and badly beaten. Now, in fear of his life, he swore upon the Bible that he would never hold legal sessions in respect of the poll tax again. Satisfied by this official capitulation, the rioters allowed the terrified Belknap to slink back to London unharmed. News of the events at Brentwood spread like wildfire throughout Essex. Now, in the fields and lanes, the marketplaces and the churchyards, local leaders whipped the peasantry into a rebellious frenzy against the poll tax. United in their determination to refuse the tax and brandishing their makeshift weapons, they attacked their landlords and the tax collectors. Now, with their blood up, the Kentish rebels marched to Rochester, where they joined up with a group of rebels from Gravesend. These men were protesting loudly at the imprisonment in Rochester Castle of one of their own townsmen, a man called Robert Belling. They were determined to free the imprisoned man. This was not an easy task, however, for Rochester Castle was under the command of the formidable Sir John Newton, who had absolutely no intention of releasing any prisoner to a lawless mob of commoners. With Newton was a garrison of trained and armed men whom he believed would do him justice as he planned the defence of the castle. So it was that on the 6th of June, the rebel army formed up into companies according to their plan of battle and waited for the order to attack. This was to be the first real test of its military ability. But the enthusiasm and commitment of the rebels was such that anything seemed possible. At first their attacks failed, but the vigour and ferocity of the final assault carried the rebels into the castle and the garrison finally capitulated. Once inside the castle, they broke open the dungeons releasing all prisoners, including Robert Belling, and plundered the castle for what booty they could find. The whole mob, now several thousand strong, marched on up the Medway and to Maidstone, which had been captured by the People's Army. All along the route, the rebels destroyed their hated tax records. The revolt was now unstoppable, and so the rebels chose to make Maidstone their headquarters. It was here that the rebels held a meeting to elect an overall commander of their army. The man they chose was to become synonymous with the peasants' revolt. His name was Watt Tyler, and he became the official leader of the rebel army on the 7th of June, 1381. There is little doubt that Tyler was a strong and charismatic figure who captivated the rebels in the makeshift army. Uh, Watt Tyler is one of those very enigmatic figures in history. 
what we know about him essentially is what he did in the Peasants' Revolt. And prior to that, we know virtually nothing about him. He probably came from Essex, um, lived in or around Chelmsford, and he may have been a tiler, as his name suggests. That means that he was part of the building trade. But he, he emerges in the course of the Peasants' Revolt. And we only know for sure that he had emerged as the leader of the peasants towards the end of the time, in fact, on the second occasion that the rebels in London met with the King Richard II at Smithfield. And there is a suggestion that by this stage, what had happened was that a large number of the rebels had already actually disappeared home, and that Tyler was the leader of a radical group uh, left in London. And the sort of demands that he made of the king in that second meeting at Smithfield would certainly suggest a growing influence by this radical element, demanding a complete change in the judicial system, uh, radical reforms of the land law, um, remissions from all their taxes and from all their obligations, and the disestablishment of the church. Wat Tyler was a, a very remarkable man, um, but he lost his life as a result of the fact that he dared to uh, stand up to the king and treat him as an equal. A story has been passed down the years which could involve the leader of the rebel army. No one is really sure of the identity of the Tyler in the narrative. Being at work in the same time tiling of a house, when he heard thereof of the tax collecting, caught his lathing staff in his hand and ran riotously home. Where, reasoning with the collector who made him so bold, the collector answered with stout words and strake at the tiler. Whereupon the tiler avoiding, smote the collector with the lathing staff that the brains flew out of his head. Whereupon great noise arose in the street and the poor people being glad, everyone prepared to support the said tiler. Was this Watt Tyler? No one will ever know, but it is clear that under Tyler, the rebel army marched with discipline and cohesion. That he was able to bring such order to his men, that such small pillage was done in the country, that the rebel army achieved what it did, are all massive testaments to the ability of Tyler. The course of events over the next few days are recorded perfectly by the anonymous chronicle of St Mary's in York. And on the Monday next, after Trinity Sunday, they came to Canterbury before the hour of noon, and 4,000 of them entering into the minster at the time of high mass, there made a reverence and cried with one voice to the monks to prepare to choose a monk for Archbishop of Canterbury. For he who is Archbishop is a traitor and shall be decapitated for his iniquity. And when they had done this, they went into the town to their fellows, and with one assent they summoned the mayor, the bailiffs, and the commons of the said town, and examined them whether they would with good will swear to be faithful and loyal to King Richard and the true commons of England or no. Then the mayor answered that they would do so willingly, and they made their oath to that effect. Then they, the rebels, asked them if they had any traitors among them, and the townsfolk said, that there were three, and named their names. These three the commons dragged out of their houses and cut off their heads. And afterwards, they took 500 men of the town with them to London, and the rest were left to guard the town. On the 11th and 12th of June, the rebel army marched to the outskirts of London, gathering more and more willing recruits as they went. As they neared the city, there was an unexpected and dramatic meeting with the king's mother, Joan of Kent, the widow of the Black Prince, who had been with a retinue on a pilgrimage to the Kentish shrines. She was now hurrying back to the safety of the strong walls of the Tower of London. The fact that she was so late in returning, despite the growing disturbances, is a further indication that still the government failed to appreciate the gravity of the situation. When Joan and her attendants encountered the host of roughly armed peasants, 
they surely must have feared the worst. But to their surprise and relief, they suffered nothing worse than jostling and coarse comments. After a brief period of peaceful arrest, the leaders of the group gave orders for the party to be released and they were allowed to proceed unmolested and unplundered. And so, while parts of his kingdom burned and his enraged subjects rampaged through towns and cities, the young King Richard remained within the Tower of London in a state of almost total inertia. But this was not altogether surprising, for the young king had been very poorly advised by his counsellors, whose prevarication and indecision allowed many legitimate military opportunities to slip by. For the fact was that the council lacked an experienced military man, a man with the necessary knowledge to present a solution to an increasingly difficult situation. John of Gaunt, whose advice would have been invaluable, was away in Edinburgh. Edmund of Cambridge had recently sailed to Portugal and Richard's uncle, Thomas of Woodstock, was lying idle in the Welsh marshes. The King's Council was comprised of men such as Archbishop Sudbury, who actually asked to be released from his duties when he was informed that the rebels were marching on London, and Hales, the treasurer, who could offer only words of hatred for the peasants as his contribution towards a solution to the crisis. During the early years of his reign, Richard II had had a series of regency councils appointed for him by Parliament, but the last of those had been dissolved uh, the year before the Peasants' Revolt, and so far as we know, Richard, although he was only 14 at the time, was already ruling uh, in his own full authority. But it's also quite clear that those who rose up against his government in 1381 were very well aware of who the important um, individuals were within his government and his council. The, the, the person that they hated most undoubtedly was his uncle, John of Gaunt. And had John of Gaunt been present in London in 1381, it's quite possible that he would have lost his life. But fortunately for him, he was away dealing with matters in the north of England. Therefore, it was the members of the king's administration uh, who became the real focus for the rebels um, and their hatred uh, in the summer of 1381, particularly the, t the king's two chief ministers, Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Chancellor, the, 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 the top man in the government, and Robert Hales, the, the treasurer, the man in charge of finance, the man, therefore, in charge of the poll tax. The way in which the rebels were able to storm the Tower of London and remove these men by force and put them to death on Tower Hill indicates the kind of paralysis that had developed uh, in the court and the council uh, at this moment of crisis and the way in which, in effect, the rebels had actually taken command of the nation. Despite this, the council did eventually manage to take some action by deciding not to send reinforcements to garrisons in Brittany. By doing this, they at least managed to retain a few score men-at-arms and archers under the old campaigner Sir Robert Knollys. Along with the 600 retainers of the king's household, they provided the royal party with their only military force. There was, however, one man of action in the royal household, one man who was capable of obstructing the progress of the rampant rebel army, his name was William Walworth, the Lord Mayor of London. Walworth sent out a deputation of citizens, comprising John Horne, Adam Carlyle and John Fresh, to warn the rebel host not to approach London, which they assured them would be defended to the death. However, the treacherous John Horne succeeded in separating himself from the deputation and managed to speak directly to Watt Tyler. He told him to disregard the deputation's threat and to advance on London with all speed, where he would find the people of London ready to support the rebellion. Horn stayed with the rebels until night fell and then smuggled three of them into the city where he sheltered them in his house. There they met the leaders of the London commoners and the final plans were laid for the rebels' great entry into London. The Anonymal Chronicles take up the story. And on the vigil of Corpus Christi Day, the commons of Kent came to Blackheath, three leagues from London, to the number of 50,000, to wait for the king. 
and they displayed two banners of St George and 40 pennons. And the commons came to the other side of the water to the number of 60,000 to aid them and to have their answer from the king. And on the Wednesday, the king being in the Tower of London, thinking to settle the business, had his barge got ready and took with him in the barge the archbishop and the treasurer and certain others of his council and four other barges and got him to Greenwich, which is three leagues from London. But there, the chancellor and the treasurer said to the king that it would be too great a folly to trust himself among the commoners, for they were men without reason and had not the sense to behave properly. As the king's barge carried him away, shouts of treason echoed all round. Now Wat Tyler, at the head of his army, gave the order to advance and take London. As the host moved into Southwark and approached London Bridge, they were met by John Horne, who was waving a standard with the royal arms which he had gained from the town clerk by false pretenses. He called to the men to advance on, for they would be welcomed by the common people of London. Horne was correct in his assumption, for as the rebel army advanced on London Bridge, an alderman named Walter Sybil lowered the drawbridge and opened the city gates, urging the rebels on into the city. The rebels, some 30,000 strong, poured across the bridge and into London's narrow streets. At the same time, on the other side of the city, William Tongue opened the old gate, thus allowing the Essex rebels, led by Thomas Farringdon and Jack Straw, to take the north of London in a sudden and unexpected rush. Despite the speed of the assault, and the high state of excitement of the men, there was no unnecessary damage or plundering, exactly as Tyler had ordered. At this time, the commons took their way through the middle of London and did no harm until they came to Fleet Street. And in Fleet Street, the men of Kent broke open the prison of the fleet and turned out all the prisoners and let them go whither they would. And they went to the temple to destroy the tenants of the said temple, and they cast the houses to the ground and threw off all the tiles and left the roofing in a bad way. And then they went toward the Savoy and set fire to diverse houses of unpopular persons on the western side. And at last they came to the Savoy and broke open the gates and entered into the place. They took all the torches they could find and burnt all the sheets and coverlets and beds and headboards of great worth, for their value was estimated at 1,000 marks. And they burnt the hall and the chambers and all the buildings within the gates of the said manor. And it is said they found three barrels of gunpowder and thought it was silver and cast into the fire and the powder exploded and set the hall a greater blaze to the great loss of the Duke of Lancaster. Clearly, the King's Council now found itself in an impossible situation. It was the Earl of Salisbury who suggested that the King should attempt to appease the rebels by promising them exactly what they wanted, but that the promises should be made falsely. After much discussion within the Council, this plan of action was agreed, and the King sent word into the street that the peasants' demands for justice would be considered and that they should return to their homes. Understandably, this message was met with total scorn, and the peasants shouted back their reply, calling for freedom from servitude, a pardon for all rebels, freedom to trade and the right to own land at fixed prices. In addition, the mob demanded that traitorous members of the government be handed over to them for execution. The peasants' response threw the council into more confusion. They were now fully aware of the fate that would await them should the rebellion succeed. King Richard was advised to try once more to appease the rebels, and so he had a bill prepared, which was sent out into the streets to be read by two knights in his service. However, the response of the crowd to Richard's proclamation was unequivocal. The cries of mockery told the King's Council all they needed to know. Their feeble attempt to placate the peasants had failed. Now only one course of action was open to them. The King would have to meet the rebels face to face and personally hear their demands. And so word was sent that King Richard II would meet Wat Tyler the following day at Mile End, a place about two miles from the Tower of London, close to the rebel camp. <laughs> 
So, on Friday the 14th of June at 7am, the king left the tower and made his way to Mile End. With the king were many of the senior nobles of the land, including Warwick, Oxford, Kent, Thomas Percy, Richard Percy and Walworth. However, two men were conspicuous by their absence. Sudbury, whose offer of resignation had been refused, and Hales. Both remained in the tower for fear of their lives. When the royal party finally reached Mile End, Tyler and his party moved forward and immediately entered into the business of the day. They made two requests. That the king allow the rebels to seize those they considered to be traitors and execute them, and that the king should at once grant the petitions and demands which Tyler held in his hands. However, Richard refused to capitulate, and the intense, nervous negotiations dragged on, with Tyler forcefully expressing the rebels' demands one by one. Finally, Richard agreed to the abolition of serfdom, free tenancy arrangements, a lifting of all restrictions on buying and selling, and agreed to pardon the rebels for their actions. As proof of his sincerity, Richard offered to set 30 clerks to work drawing up charters of freedom for all districts of the realm. Securing the knowledge that the king had granted their demands, Tyler and his men entered the Tower of London. The royal guards made no attempt to halt them, and the confident rebels searched the whole building, checking every room and passage. Eventually, their search proved fruitful. The appalling Sudbury had taken refuge in a chapel, claiming he was taking mass. In fact, he had taken three masses in an attempt to stall the rebels long enough to make good his escape. But the rebel soldiers finally lost their patience and dragged him to Tower Hill, where he was summarily beheaded. The treasurer Hales and the king's sergeant-at-arms were also found, and they were taken to Tower Hill to suffer the same terrible fate as Sudbury. While Wat Tyler and his men were dispatching the traitors in the tower, the peasants' army were running riot in London, and the chronicles tell us of events with horrific accuracy. And at the same time, the commons made proclamation that whoever could catch any Fleming or other alien of any nation might cut off his head. And so they did after this. And then they took the heads of the archbishops and of others and put them on wooden poles and carried them before them in procession as far as the shrine of Westminster Abbey, in despite of them and God and Holy Church. And vengeance descended on them no long time after. Then they returned to London Bridge and set the head of the archbishop on the gate with eight others they had murdered, so that all could see who passed over the bridge. This done, they went to the church of St. Martin's in the Vintry and found therein 35 Flemings whom they dragged out and beheaded in the streets. On that day were beheaded in all some 140 or 160 persons. Then they took their way to the house of the Lombards and other aliens and broke into their dwellings and robbed them of all the goods they could lay their hands on. This went on for all that day and the following night with hideous and horrible tumult. The next morning, Saturday, great numbers of the commons came to Westminster Abbey at the hour of Tess, and there they found John Imworth. Marshal of the Marshalsea and Warden of the Prisoners, a tormentor without pity. He was at the shrine of St. Edward's to crave aid and succour from that saint to preserve him from his enemies. But the commons wrenched him away from the shrine and dragged him away to Cheapside and there beheaded him. And on this day at three in the afternoon, the king came to the Abbey of Westminster and some 200 persons with him. And the abbot and the monks of the said abbey and the canons and vicars of St. Stephen's Chapel came to meet in procession, clothed in their copes and their feet naked. And they brought him to the high altar of the church. And the king made his prayer devoutly and left offerings for the altar and the relics. And afterwards, the king caused a proclamation to be made that all the commons of the country who were still in London should come to Smithfield to meet him there. But as the peasant army satisfied its burning desire for revenge, 
its fortunes were taking a distinct turn for the worse. For the king's request for a meeting at Smithfield had sinister and ominous overtones. Quite simply, the royal party planned to lure Tyler into a private conference where he would be seized and murdered. The Smithfield meeting was a carefully planned, murderous trap. When Richard met the rebels at Mile End, he made a series of promises to them, uh, including, most obviously, um, charters of pardon and charters of remission from serfdom. What happened in the following 24 hours is uncertain, but it would seem that the King's Council, which had been in a kind of paralysis up until that point, finally pulled together, and that certain individuals there, probably figures like the Earls of Arundel and Oxford and Salisbury and Suffolk, convinced Richard, or went behind Richard's back, and planned um, a military vengeance against, against the rebels. The meeting at Smithfield was a turning point in the Peasants' Revolt. It is difficult to believe that Tyler had no suspicions at all as to the King's motives for a private meeting. Perhaps he was a victim of the carelessness that overconfidence can bring. He approached the King with a swagger and proceeded to outline a list of new demands. This time his target was the Church, which Tyler demanded should be stripped of its powers, leaving all men answerable to the King's laws alone that all men be free and equal before the law, and that the law should no longer be able to enforce outlawry on anyone. King Richard listened intently as Tyler made his long speech, and then answered coolly and calmly that all his demands would be met. But first, the rebel soldiers must stop the killings and return to their homes. It was now that a dramatic and famous scene unfolded. Tyler called for a draught of ale which he swigged down in front of the king. In the age of chivalry, this was an unforgivable insult to the monarch, and it presented the royal party with an ideal opportunity. As Tyler drank, a young page rushed forward, crying out in a loud voice that Tyler was the greatest thief and robber in Kent. Tyler demanded satisfaction for the insult and fatally drew his dagger. As the steel blade flashed in the sunlight, William Woolworth, the Lord Mayor of London, rushed forward to write his name in the pages of English history. Declaring Tyler arrested, he and his men closed around the peasant leader who now realized he had fallen into a trap. For Tyler, the end had come and he was struck down by swords and daggers, his mutilated body falling only 40 paces from the king. The rebel army, waiting for their leader to return, grew suspicious. Now the king played his key part in the plan by approaching the rebel army and crying out that Tyler had been knighted for his deeds. He ordered the army to march to St John's Fields where Tyler would meet them. Amid some confusion, the peasants obeyed their king and began their march towards the fields. Meanwhile, Woolworth rode into London and called on the aldermen there to muster a force for the defence of the king who, he assured them, was surrounded by the rebels. The men of the 24 wards of London frantically came together to save the life of their king. Before long, the Royalist army had mustered some 3,000 troops who were placed under the command of Sir Robert Knollys. This small army now ran to the northwest gate of London to prepare an ambush for the rebel army, who were approaching the city walls preparing to greet their leader, Tyler. Nollies and his army quickly seized the initiative, and before they could respond, the rebel army was surrounded and overpowered. The frightened and confused peasants could only watch in horror as the Lord Mayor, Walworth, rode towards them in triumph, brandishing the head of Watt Tyler. Triumph had quickly turned into disaster. With their revered leader dead, morale and resolve in the peasant army wilted visibly. The Earl of Salisbury came forward to assure the peasants that their hard-won concessions would still be met, and he urged them to disperse and go home. Almost pathetically, the simple common folk believed him. With heavy hearts, they gradually turned towards their country homes and villages. <laughs> 
With the threat to London and to the king diminished, the royal army quickly regained control of the city and reprisals began almost immediately. As they journeyed home, erstwhile rebels were rounded up and put to death. Ironically, many were executed at Cheapside, where only a few days earlier rebel leaders had beheaded so many in the name of the rebellion. With London secured, the King's Council turned their attention to the counties. They sent out urgent calls to rally to the royal standard on Blackheath. Hundreds of lords with their men gathered there, emerging from the hiding places that had seen them safe during the rebellion. By the 18th, a large enough force had been gathered to enable the council to proclaim the arrest of all malefactors and the dispersal of all unruly groups. On the 22nd of June, the force entered Waltham, where Richard raised his standard. Nearby was the last remnants of the rebel army pledged to fight to the death to preserve the rights they had won. A deputation from the rebel army was sent to meet the king with demands for the ratification of the charters he had granted and the rights that these afforded. The venom and vehemence of the council response was exposed in the words of King Richard. O oh, most vile and odious by land and sea, you who are not worthy to live when compared with the lords whom you have attacked, you should be forthwith punished with the vilest deaths were it not for the office you bear. Go back to your comrades and bear the king's answer. You were and are serfs, and shall remain in bondage, not that of old, but one infinitely worse, more vile without comparison. The king also forswore all connection with the rebels and forbade the use of his name to support their crimes. In fear of their lives, the deputation was dismissed from the royal presence in order to convey the message to the rebel camp at Billericay. For the last brave men of the rebel army, the moment of truth had arrived. Almost suicidally, they reaffirmed their sworn intention to enjoy the privileges they had won or die in the attempt. And so preparations were made for a last-ditch stand at Billericay. On the 28th of June, 1381, the royal host drew up its forces before the rebel camp. Both sides ignored the normal conventions of war, and as their frustration and anger boiled over, the royal army bore down mercilessly onto the rebels, most of whom had never seen warfare in their lives. The fighting was sharp and bloody as the royal army smashed the rebel defences in one charge and sent the defenders fleeing in terror. Many were cut down in the terrible pursuit which followed. Over 500 peasants were killed and many more were caught and executed as punishment for their treason. The fate of the rebellion was now sealed, and all over the country risings were put down as loyal men flocked to the king's cause. On July the 2nd, a proclamation was issued officially revoking all the charters issued at Mile End, clearing the way for a judicial inquiry. As England slowly returned to normal, officials such as Belknap returned to their duties, gaining evidence of crimes against the government and administering the poll tax. The government certainly had no intention of letting the architects and perpetrators of the rebellion go unpunished. The trials which took place in London, Essex and Kent saw hundreds of people hanged in the name of the king, although very few gave evidence against their fellow citizens. However, the vicious judicial reprisals offered a splendid opportunity for the settlement of grudges and personal enmities, and it is known that many innocent people went to the gallows. And what of John Ball, whose teachings and sermons had provided the spark for the Great Rebellion? Arrested at Coventry and brought before his accusers on July the 13th, 1381, Ball proudly acknowledged his part in the struggle, declared he had no regrets, and flatly refused to ask for a pardon. Two days later, on July 15th, he suffered the barbarous fate of those accused of treason. He was hung, drawn and quartered, and his dismembered body sent to the four corners of England. At last, on the 30th of August, King Richard issued a proclamation deferring judgment of offenders to their local courts, and the reign of judicial terror was at an end.
The Peasants' Revolt was a unique event and nothing of the same dimensions occurred at any other time in the Middle Ages. And because of that, it's really quite difficult to establish what its consequences really were. It's often been suggested that the only real result of the Peasants' Revolt was the abandonment of the poll tax. But in a longer and perhaps an accidental or incidental sense, the century after the Peasants' Revolt did in fact see many of the demands of the rebels in 1381 becoming a reality. Most obviously, as a result of the great change in the social and economic structure during that period, the conditions of life of ordinary people in England improved enormously. The Peasants' Revolt had been crushed by a combination of duplicity, treachery and superior force. For a few brief, glorious days, what Tyler and his army of commoners had bathed in the warm glow of new hope. Now the dream had gone. Villains returned to break their backs on the land and heartless lords and poor government once more thrived in English society. But although the rebellion had failed, King Richard's unhappy reign was constantly blighted by the seething discontent of his subjects. So it was that the spirit of the great peasants' revolt of 1381 lived on.